Hi, I'm Hannah Fafelder Katzman on behalf of the Center for Women's Justice. I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to our event with Dr. Susan Weiss and Professor Shulamit Magnus. We're commemorating Aguna Day, Yom Haguna, which will take place as every year on Tani Tester, this year, the fast of Esther, of Esther, this year it falls on Thursday, and we hope that we won't be needing it next year. This event is being recorded. The Center for Women's Justice supports and defends women's rights in Israel whenever they are harmed by religion in the name of the state. After I introduce the speakers, I'll turn over the floor to Susan and Shulamit. And if you have questions, you can send them by chat to the hosts. Susan Weiss, PhD, is the founder and executive director of the Center for Women's Justice. Susan's been actively working to find solutions for Jewish women surrounding divorce for over 20 years, first as a private attorney, then as the founder and director of Yadl Isha from 1997 to 2004, and now as the founder and executive director of CWJ. Susan initiated the innovative tactic of securing compensatory damage awards for women whose husbands withheld a get by filing damage cases in Israeli civil courts, a tactic called, a tactic called game changing by Haaretz. Susan has uh, Susan co-authored a book with Nettie C. Gross Horowitz, Marriage and Divorce in the Jewish State, Israel's Civil War. Professor Shulamit Magnus is an historian and author focusing on Jewish studies. Her work often centers around the role of women in Jewish history. Professor Magnus has taught at Hebrew University, the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford University, and Oberlin College, where she's a professor emerita and was a founder and director of the Program of Jewish Studies. Professor Magnus has authored several books, including Jewish Emancipation in a German City, Cologne, 1798 to 1871, a two-volume unabridged translation and critical edition of Pauline Wengeroff, Memoirs of a Grandmother, Scenes from the Cultural History of the Jews of Russia in the 19th Century, and A Woman's Life, Pauline Wengeroff and Memoirs of a Grandmother. In addition, Professor Magnus has authored many articles on similar topics, and her thoughts can often be found in many opinion pieces. She contributed to publications such as Tablet, Times of Israel, Jerusalem Post, Moment, and The Forward. Professor Magnus is a founder of Women's Group Prayer at the Kotel and is first named plaintiff in a case before the Supreme Court of Israel for enforcement of Jewish women's right to lead, to read Torah at the Kotel. For her important work, Professor Magnus was awarded a National Jewish Book Award and a Hadassah Brandeis Translation Award. Okay, Susan, over to you. All right. Hey. Um, okay. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And of course, thank you for sure me for agreeing to speak with us about her important new book. Um, I would like to take a special shout out, I hope, to Rachel Stomel, who is an, who is on uh Hufshat Leida, who's on pregnancy leave from the Center for Women's Justice. So I hope will be joining us. So before I ask Shumami to start to tell us about her book, which is going to be the main part of our conversation this evening. I would like to just say that on a personal note, Shulamit was the very first Jewish feminist that I ever encountered. Okay, I, I know Shulamit from the time uh, from, from the time that I was a young child uh, growing up in Bayside, Queens. And I remember vividly, I think I was a young teenager, uh, when I saw Shulamit at Kiddush one, uh, one Shabbat, when uh, she refused to, to allow a man to make Kiddush for her. And it was a shocking event for me. I couldn't understand it, but that was, I think, the beginning of my feminist consciousness. And I believe that uh, Shulamit will be continuing uh, to raise our feminist consciousness this evening. Um, and that none of you will be disappointed. I also wanna say a special sh shout out to other, some, some special Jewish feminists that I see have joined us like Rachel Adler and Norma Joseph. So thank you very much for being here with us. Okay, so let's begin. Shulamit, um, tell us about your book. Okay. Um, I want to begin this evening by acknowledging that it's been a terrible time for this country and for Jews across the world, and I know it continues to be. As happens in wartime, Regular life, good and bad, continues alongside the war and its devastation. 
births and other happy occasions, illness and traffic accidents. It is intolerable that part of normal Jewish life is the regular, normal, ongoing creation of Agunot, which has continued throughout this war as it did before and will after it, until and unless we intervene to end this abuse. I distinguish between managing a gun, marital captivity of women, which is what is happening now, a whole industry of managing it and ending it. To manage a gun is to concede that it is an unsolvable problem, which indeed halachic authorities say it is. To end it is to resolve that it must end and then find ways to achieve that. I have a new book about to go to press. Oops. Everything okay? I just heard a beep. Are we good? We're fine. We're fine. Yes. Okay. New book about to go to press. It's entitled in part, Thinking Outside the Chains about Jewish marital captivity. And that is what I say has to happen for Igun to end and Agunot to be freed. The old stuff doesn't work and won't work. If you want to have this same conversation in another year or another decade or another century, keep doing what is being done now. If you want a different conversation, then indeed let us have one. I want to say at the outset that I do not see Igun as an Orthodox or an Israeli problem, but as a Jewish one, which we are all enjoin, enjoined to engage, whatever our religious or geographic positioning. Fundamentally, I don't even see it as a woman's problem, though of course, obviously it is, but a pathology of Jewish society. I do not see it as a halachic problem, but a political one, that is having to do with power. I can say more about all of this. My new book is unusual in that it is a work of both scholarship and advocacy. It has two parts. Part one is history, the first history of Igun and Agunot from early medieval times to the present and across the Jewish world. The Middle East and North Africa, Ashkenaz, Sfarad, the Mediterranean, Europe, East and West in modernity, the pre-state issue of Israel and the US. Part two is an analysis and critique of current policy in the US and Israel about Igun and proposals to end it. Tonight, I will give you some of the basics from both parts of the book. I will start with the second area, policy analysis and critique, and then I'll offer you some results of some pretty astonishing historical research about Jewish women, Agunot, from the past, whose beha behavior, I say, should be models for us now. Maase imahot siman levanot not suggesting, however, that women do this on our own, but within a new community paradigm that A, sees Igun as a Jewish problem, and B, sets out to end it. I don't have much time for all of that, but I'll try. There has been much discussion since October 7th of the Conceptia that blinded the government, the security and intelligence establishments here, the army, keeping them in an echo chamber of unchallenged assumptions, which prevented them from understanding evidence right in front of them causing them to dismiss anyone prominently and not coincidentally women, the Tatspitaniyot, who called out the reality they were seeing to superiors who dismissed it because it did not fit with their conceptions and because the evidence came from women. I am saying that we are locked into a conceptia about Igun and Agunot. We are inured to the normality of this abuse. We accept it as normal and inevitable, if regrettable, of course. Part of the conceptia is that Igun is a quote unquote tragedy, a terrible misfortune that falls on some women whose husbands, it turns out, are not nice men. Women who then can't get relief in rabbinic courts because, you know, this is a terribly difficult problem, a real mess. And sometimes, you know, it never gets fixed. And the or Aguna remains well captive. Language builds conceptia. I've already used some, the poor Aguna, the wretched Aguna, the tragedy. I will remind us that the word tragedy from the Greek means something faded, inevitable, and unavoidable. Igun is nothing of the sort. It is a literally man-made problem, and the only inevitable thing about it is that it flows necessarily from rabbinic marriage. To which point I'll turn in a minute, but first, more about language and the circular prison of the Igun and Agunot Conceptia. Images are also language, so let us look at the image now on the screen. This is the cover of a book, a learned tome of, I don't know, 400 pages or so, about the halachot of marriage and divorce in rabbinic law and the problem of, problems of Agunot. 
and all the proposals that have been made over decades and more than decades of dealing with it. Look at the image. Um, the title of the book is Akat Dalot, which means the cry of the oppressed, the cry of the wretched. You see here a woman who is bent. She her head is her hair is covered. She's piously dressed, modestly dressed, and she's enveloped in chains. If you look down at the bottom, her feet there's a ball, ball in chains, and then you see a child, a female child who is embracing her, as she perhaps contemplates her future as a as an aguna, as a victim. There are plenty of such images that accompany reporting about aguna, chains, handcuffs. It's almost like an SMM portrait, except there's of course no M in it because the women are not putting themselves in this situation. All of this, I say, feeds an image of women as normal, inevitable victims, a class of victims meriting pity. Women are solidified into a victim class, which helps ensure that women stay victims. Even the title of this book, Zakatalot, is part of the conceptia. The term from the Talmud is used again and again about Agunot. Again, it means the cry of the wretched. I'm not saying that these victims are not victims so that they do not suffer egregiously and have ruined lives. I am saying that the constant repetition of this refrain and these images about poor, wretched women struck by tragedy not only derives from the embedded problem, but however unwittingly, for some at least, perpetuates it, traps us in a conceptia that keeps igun, the marital captivity of women, going. It typecasts women, agunot, who then remarkably continue to play that role because nothing effective is done to break out of the conceptia. I'm saying that agunade is part of the conceptia. Tell me one aguna who has been freed as a result of this well-meaning ritualization of the abuse of igun, its normalization on the Jewish calendar. Tell me how agunade has contributed to the end of igun. What is the goal, the effect of such a day? As my mother, Zechronal of Rechai, used to say about Mother's Day, what about the rest of the year? About Aguna days, we can only cite Miroslav Volf. Speaking of prayers and ritualized responses in the U.S. after the latest mass shooting, followed by no effective action against gun violence. Quote, there is something deeply hypocritical about praying for a problem you are unwilling to resolve, unquote. If you tell me that Aguna Day has led to greater awareness of halachic prenuptial agreements, I will tell you that peddling such agreements as a mean to, means to prevent Igun is not only conceptia, but deceptia, deception. First, prenups, everyone would agree, do nothing, zero, nada, plum, for Agunot. The focus on prenups elides over the reality of women chained in marriage against their will or extorted for their freedom now systematically abused for months, years, decades in rabbinic courts now. But even about prevention, prenups are contracts. Contracts are violated all the time. To enforce a prenup against a reneging partner, litigation is needed. Litigation means tremendous expense and acute stress, the threat of which is used against women to get them to accept bad terms for a get. No different than primary get refusal and extortion. There are also varieties of prenups and some are worse than none and people need to know that and I don't think they do because Aguna advocacy organizations don't operate independently on behalf of women to do that consumer education but operate under the aegis, the control of whatever rabbinic establishments they do. The Center for Women's Justice prenup is the best out there but none are guarantees. To peddle prenups as a prevention of Igun is to put a stumbling block before the blind. Prenups are also absolutely nothing new. The ketubah is a prenup. As a legal, actionable document, it is so useless and has long been so useless that people don't seem to know that. And certainly most don't even read it as a serious document binding the, the husband, the Baal. As calligraphy, adorned art, yes. As a legal document, please. But detailed prenups, aside from the ketubah, were an intrinsic part of Jewish marital practice throughout Jewish history, everywhere Jews lived, well into modernity. And the historical record shows mountains of disputes over prenups not honored or contested in order to better the husband's 
or his family's circumstances and divorce, whatever he agreed to before the marriage. So to discover America, as it were, Eureka, prenups, and peddle them as a solution, never mind the solution to Wigun, is at the least to be monumentally ignorant of Jewish history, but more importantly, to mislead the ignorant and to divert attention from the real problem that would end, not keep managing, Igun. Prenups address a symptom while hiding and propagating the cause of the abuse, which is Kinyan and Kiddushin is the manner in which traditional halachic marriage is enacted. Kinyan and Kiddushin, not bad husbands or bad rabbis, though both abound, are the origin and cause of Igun. Don't take my word for it. Let me read you the words of Rabbi J. David Bleich on the very right wing of modern orthodoxy in the U.S. about what halachic marriage is and why divorce is the husband's sole prerogative. Quote, halachic marriage is an exclusive conjugal servitude of the bride to the groom. Understanding that the essence of marriage lies in the conveyance of a property interest by the bride to the groom serves to explain why it is that only the husband can dissolve the marriage. As the beneficiary of the wife's servitude, divestiture, that is divorce, requires the husband's voluntary surrender of the right that he has acquired via Kinyan and Kiddushin. Let's be clear here. The property interest which Rabbi Bleich references, which is the Baal's possession during the marriage, is the woman's body and reproductivity, exclusive access to which the Baal acquires in Kinyan and sanctifies in Kiddushin. In Kinyan, authority over the woman's body passes from her father or other male guardian to her new male, to her new Baal, master or owner. This terrible term perfectly fits this situation, which is why the biblical and rabbinical texts use it and why we never should regarding another human being, never mind half the Jewish people, women, or about marriage. There is no putting perfume on this animal. The reality I've just described, and again, don't take my word for it, is relayed clearly in Birkat Erusim under the chuppah. So I'm going to read from the Sidur. It's in every Shabbat Birchon. It's in every Sidur. And it reads as follows. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read it in the, in the English. Blessed are you, a sovereign of the universe, sanctified us with our your commandments, commanded us concerning illicit relations, meaning sexual relations. You have forbidden us, those who are merely betrothed, and permitted us, those who are married to us, through consecrated wedlock, blessed are you, and so on. So this is, um, this blessing is pronounced this is the moment that the woman's body becomes exclusively permissible to her Baal. But note that the language is plural, us, us, the reference being to men, to male group privilege to which the new Baal is being initiated. The bride stands there silent, being sexually objectified, commodified, and traded. And this degradation is hailed yet as mikudeshet, mikudeshet, to the sound of applause and music. Men are the community, women their other possessions, sex objects, their sexuality acquired through proper public rituals. The meaning of this act is made clear in several Talmudic passages. The Talmud in Shabbos 33a puts it with bracing honesty in the name of Hanan bar Rava. Everyone knows why the bride enters the marriage can canopy to be acquired for, by, by her Baal for licit, that is married sex, which act married sex, confirms and establishes the marriage. About all this, one can only cite the words of the Talmud in Ketubah's 10b, which speaks honestly of what is transpiring, quoting the following in the name of Rabbi or Rebbe, who said to a man who came questioning the virginity of his new wife, go and enjoy your acquisition. Halachic marriage is the source of women's marital captivity. To ignore the source of the problem and focus on later consequences as if they, Abusive husbands and rabbis who enable them were causes rather than necessary end products of the system is to guarantee that Igun continues. It is to deceive the unknowing and lead new victims to harm. Tinkering with measures that manage rather than end the problem ensures the problem's continuation. Kinyan and Kiddushim are unilateral acts by the Baal enacted on a passively acquiescing wife. This being the case, divorce is also unilateral, enacted by the Baal. 
And here is the origin of Igun and of get extortion, which is absolutely nothing new. It has been happening since the beginning of Jewish recorded time because the abuse is inherent and necessary in the system. To act as if it isn't, as if you can attack get extortion while retaining Kenyan and Kiddushin is conceptia and deceptia, deception. Every woman married in this manner is an aguna in waiting there, but for the luck or lack of it. To focus on prenups in this situation is, I say, like taking poison and having an antidote in the drawer and hoping it works. Aside from the necessary and inevitable consequences of Kinyan and Kiddushin in the creation of Igun, they are fundamentally degrading to women's human and Jewish dignity and should be retired on that ground alone. In my book, I discuss alternatives posed by Rabbi Rachel Adler, by Tzemach Yoreh and others, based on other areas of rabbinic law, for example, business partnership, shudef, law, shutafut, whose imagined users are all men and which therefore, utterly unlike Kinyan and Kiddushin, protect both partners. My point is that renouncing an abusive method of enacting marriage need not mean renouncing all of rabbinic law. That is a discussion in its own right. I would just note, speaking of embedded conceptions, that all I have been describing is a system by men for women. Male immunity from this problem underlies its persistence. Rabbi Dov Linzer, head of Yeshivat Chavavei Torah, told me that his father, also a rabbinic judge, asked him once how long these laws would last if men were subject to them. The answer, they would never have been written. If the question is what I am saying it must be, which is how do we end Igun and Friagunot and not keep managing it with non-solutions like prenups, we first of all have to tell one another the truth and second, stop repeating methods that don't work. Speaking of honesty, the phrase agunot and misoravot get that has come into use relatively recently is misleading. A woman denied a get is an aguna, same as a woman whose husband has disappeared or converted or a widow from a childless marriage who can't get chalitza. The halachic status of these all these women, regardless of the circumstance, is the same. They are agunot, unfree to end marriage and remarry. There is plenty of effort to deny the reality and extent of igun and the numbers of agunot. Aguna advocates should not participate in that deception. So first, tell the truth, and second, stop doing what doesn't work. Appeals to rabbis in any rabbinic establishment do not work. Look around you. Have they worked? They've, they've, been, they've been done for years, decades, centuries. Yes, centuries. Blue Greenberg wrote about agunot and divorce abuse appealing to halachic change in a book on women in Judaism published almost 50 years ago in 1981. A few years ago, decades after Greenberg's book, Rivka Hautzal and Susan Aronoff published a book, The Wedlock Agunot, in which they said, quote, we believe halachic solutions to this problem exist. Over the ages, wise rabbis have devised ways of easing difficulties caused by halachic strictures. In the area of finance, for example, the clear Torah prohibition against Jews taking interest on loans to other Jews has been circumvented. Banks in Israel, and even in some in the U.S. that serve Orthodox clientele, make use of heteriska, a, rabbin a rabbinically created document which structures forbidden interest as profit from an investment, unquote. In fact, Numerous aguna advocates, unbeknownst to one another, have cited et heter iska in particular, as well as other halachic reforms that obviated biblical prohibitions, in arguing that halachic solutions to igun and freeing agunot exist, but are not being applied. So see, for example, the list produced by the Australian aguna advocacy group, Unchain My Heart, some years ago. It's a list of biblical prohibitions that rabbinic um, efforts did um, end runs around, basically obviated them. The first one on the list is the same one, Heterix Iska. It's a very popular uh, uh, reform that Aguna, Aguna, Aguna advocates uh, refer to. But such appeals go back way earlier than the 1980s, never mind more recent such expressions. Even the language, the exact same language and appeals were used a century ago. At the 1927 International Conference for the Protection of Jewish Girls and Women in London, Bertha Pappenheim, the Orthodox founder and leader of the Jewish Women's Organization in Germany, was the Jofa of its time, spoke bitterly about the failure of the rabbinate to address Igun, saying, 
We have at this meeting several rabbis from Eastern Europe, and I had hoped that they would listen to us and do something to improve the difficult position of so many Jewish women. It is not only a question of agunot, but also of facilitating divorce. I had a hope that a Sanhedrin of rabbis would come together and that they would introduce the needed ritual reforms and reorganize Jewish ceremonial dealing with this matter. That is what I hope, but I have been told that we must not expect it, for the rabbis do not have the power to introduce changes that we've asked for. In that case, we must continue to flounder within the gullus, the exile, but it is a gullus within a gullus. That is, women's predicament was its own exile in addition to the general Jewish exile. Naomi Seidman, in her wonderful biography of Sarah Schneerer, founder of the Beis Yaakov movement, writes, Pappenheim was not persuaded that the rabbis were truly powerless to address the problem of the Yaguna. She was particularly offended that rabbis seemed willing to reform Jewish law to make business dealings easier, a reference to heteriska, while claiming that the same could not be done for women. In September 1929, Pappenheim, who envisioned a solution to Yaguna, as only possible coming from orthodox decisors and was convinced that halachic means to this end existed, sent a letter to the great assembly of the rabbis of Agudas Yisrael, then meeting in Vienna. One of Agudas' innovations was the concept of Das Torah, a dogma-like belief in rabbinic decision-making by Aguda rabbis as infallible, even about political matters. Marriage and divorce, of course, are core areas of rabbinic jur jurisprudence and a good as council of rabbinic sages, the main forum for deciding policy for the party and its followers met regularly. The assertion of such supreme rabbinic authority operating in so highly organized a structure seems to have encouraged Pappenheim to expect decisive action to help Agunot, of whom World War I and massive pogroms in Ukraine following it produced an estimated 20,000 on top of those already made Agunot for the normally occurring reasons. Pappenheim's letter to the Aguda's Great Assembly of Rabbis came after the Second World Congress of Jewish Women meeting in Hamburg in June 1929 had passed a resolution calling for a convention of Orthodox rabbis that would craft a, quote, comprehensive approach to the problem of Igun, unquote. Pappenheim, like Aguna advocates today, stressed the life wasted when women were made Agunot and pleaded for rabbis to take this seriously as a cause for action. Head of a resolutely moderate feminist organization that championed marriage and child rearing, Pappenheim lamented the forced celibacy and childlessness of Agunot because they lost their fertile years in Igun and decried the path to prostitution to desperate poverty caused or exacerbated by their captivity. Her letter was a heartfelt plea to these rabbinic authorities, whose authority in their own minds was so potent, to use that authority and help Agunot, quote, so that to the number of Jewish men in all the countries who fell victim to the world war shall not be added a large number of women who will be buried alive as widows or sink into un-Jewish living, prostitution. Lack of rabbinic action, Pappenheim said, was lowering the esteem of rabbis and causing the weakening of the influence of orthodoxy. Again, Pappenheim sent that letter in 1929. That's almost 100 years ago. In the 1980s, Rivka Hout and Susan Aronoff got into the business of helping Agunot, assisted by Rivka's husband, Erwin Zal, a lawyer and Orthodox Musmach, convinced that there were halachic solutions and that it was a matter of effort. Here is what they concluded after 30 years of that effort in a book published a few years ago. Quote, we say to women loud and clear, stay away from Orthodox rabbinic courts. They articulate no alternative, however. Susan may ask me about alternatives I propose. This is what they said to sum up their decades of work. We have done all we can in this three decades long struggle. When we began, we thought that raising the awareness of the dimensions and severity of the Aguna problem would spur rabbis to action. When we realized this was hopeless, we thought that mobilizing community pressure on the rabbis would bring change. That too, we discovered was a misconception. We did succeed in putting agunasik on the Orthodox community's agenda. We believe that our aguna advocacy deserves credit for the adoption of religious prenuptial agreements. The limit of limited value, these prenuptials are better than nothing. The marketing of these prenuptials as a solution, however, deludes the community into thinking that the aguna problem is solved, which sadly is untrue, unquote. So more of the same will produce more of the same. That is true in this situation as in any other. 
whether Einstein said it or not, the definition of insanity and certainly of futility is doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results. Unless, of course, you wish the same results, and some indeed do. The rest of us need to wake up and smell the coffee. So I've written a new book, which is why the Center for Women's Justice invited me to present at night. And since we are on the eve of Purim and noting Aguna Day, I have focused thus far on practice and policy. I'd like to take the remaining minutes to say something about the history of all this and its connection to now. Jewish women have a history. We are part, of course, of what has been called Jewish history, and we are part of the Jewish present. But that history, as well as the current reality, are written, narrated, and constructed from and about the behavior of men. Google Jews, the term Jews, and tell me if even one image comes up female. Good historical awareness informs good, useful, present consciousness, without which there is no useful, present behavior. That is what Jewish women have lacked and what we can get from women's history altogether and from a history of Igun and Agunot in particular. Until very recently, with the publication of an excellent book by Noah Shashar, Agunot, women in Jewish marital captivity, have been treated as a problem in rabbinic jurisprudence rather than as a class of Jewish women with a history. Igun has been perceived as a category of rabbinic marital law rather than as a social institution and a pathology like slavery with a history. When the quote-unquote Aguna problem has been addressed, this has been by rabbis writing apologetically of the quote problem as a tragedy, which in an oft-employed usage, rabbis have quote-unquote left no stone unturned to address compassionately. Noah's book and mine put the decisive lie to that claim. That desire to compassion is stymied, however, apologists explain by the limits of the rabbinic law they practice. I'm an historian, a social and cultural historian of the Jews with a particular interest in the history of women. That is in part what brought me to write a history of Igun and Agunot. I have sought to take women out of the abstraction of rabbinic discourse as objects of male deliberation, women as category of the male gaze and male definition, and discover how real women actually behaved across Jewish time and space to prevent their falling into igun or yibun, the acquirement of a widow in a childless marriage to marry her husband's brother, and what they did when they fell into those states to try to extricate themselves. It turns out they did a lot, and they were not good girls, nice girls, not at all, but they were excellent Jews, the best of Jews, I have already mentioned detailed prenuptial agreements that regulated things from where the couple could live with the husband not being able to demand that a wife move to a location far from her natal family, to him not being able to marry a second wife, to him not being able to demand from her an accounting of household possessions upon his return from business trips. There were clauses that specified that in the event of the husband's death with no children born to him, his wife would not have to marry the lever the yabam, or pay him off to get free. And yes, chalitza extortion was normal, common, every day throughout Jewish history, as was get extortion. Some of these prenups even specified how much the widow would have to pay the lever to get out of such a marriage. So expected was the extortion. Those provisions too were contested. Just because there are agreements and written rules does not mean that they are implemented then or now. I show that women in medieval Ashkenaz, Spain, and the Middle East were economically very active, that their activities were very valuable to their families and communities, and that the women, their families, and their communities all knew this and acted on it. Women used their economic clout to demand protections for themselves in marriage and divorce, and they got it. Not because rabbis were benevolent and not because women asked nicely, much less pleaded, because they, but because they acted using tough measures. Important reforms that came in the medieval period, including the Takanot, the ordinances attributed to Rabbeinu Gershom or Agala against polygyny and against divorce of a wife against her will, another major reform enacted throughout the Jewish world was conditional divorces set to take effect at a certain date unless revoked. This was done to perfect, protect women from igun if husbands deserted, abandoned them, which many did or just did not return from business trips because of illness, criminal acts, or incidents, accidents. Women and female kin on their behalf pressured rabbinic and communal authorities for these reforms, including with ultimatums. 
We have explicit statements by post-skim ref uh, decisors referencing the economic power of women and the importance of their contributions, making it necessary to override Talmudic pro prohibitions on women, for instance, being alone with non-Jewish men, because it was imperative for women moneylenders to meet with their Christian male clients or against women appearing in court, all of which behavior was happening as a matter of course, which then got rabbinic permission after the fact. Much recent scholarship has shown that pre-modern Jews, men and women alike, but prominently women in divorce cases use non-Jewish courts, both Christian, non-ecclesiastic and Muslim, religious, and state mus by state Muslim authorities to better their chances in rabbinic courts about divorce. They use these actions and the threat of them to force better divorce decisions than they would otherwise get. Rabbis knew that women did this and they adjusted rulings post facto in accord with the reality that was occurring. Women extracted conditional divorces from husbands and then hid upon the men's return if this was before the date on which the divorce went into effect, waiting out the date so that they forced the divorce. The behavior was so common, rabbis mentioned it as such. Thus, Rabbi David ben Zimra, the Radbaz, called it, quote, an everyday occurrence and the means by which women attain, quote, the privilege to be freed of their husbands, unquote. Rabbinic sources quote one 16th century woman from Damascus who waited out the term of her conditional divorce, given not because her husband was traveling, but because of severe marital breakdown. If he did not succeed in placating her within 30 consecutive days, it would take effect. And she declared, the get is a kosher get. It was conditional on my being reconciled and reunited with my husband, but I did not reunite with him because I didn't want to reconcile. And I hid in order to flee and I have received my get. And now give me my ketubah, the monetary divorce settlement. No less than the widowed daughter-in-law of Yosef Karo, whom I trust we have all heard of, as in Shulchan Aruch fame. In 16th century, Tzvat freed herself from a leveret marriage she did not wish. Again, this is Karo's daughter-in-law. There was incentive for levers to say that they wanted to enact levered marriage because first this meant an opportunity to extort, extort the widow to be released from this requirement through chalitza. And second, because forcing the widow to marry the lever meant that the deceased man's assets would return to his family rather than the widow getting her ketubah settlement and any other sums due her. Forcing the widow into a levered marriage also meant that her dowry, which remains a wife's property during the marriage, but which the husband can use for business purposes, typically to secure loans, became the new Baal's resource. There was plenty of male incentive to force lever at marriage or for levers to just claim they wished it, and plenty of evidence that women resisted this actively, inventively, and transgressively. After two years of wrangling with Karo's son, during which this woman was an aguna, her family advised her to go to the synagogue where the lever, and I am sure Karo was as well, on a Monday morning during a Torah reading, go up to the lever and spit in his face three times, each time exclaiming, this is the lever, I do not want him, spit. This is the lever, I do not want him, spit. This is the lever, I do not want him, spit, which she did. This then set off learned debate among the sages of Tzvat and then of Jerusalem. Did her act mean that the lever was now forced to give her chalitza? Some decisors incensed by, incensed by her assertiveness and female presumption on halachic processes, rightly the preserve of men, favored punishing her, arguing that there should be no, quote, coercion of the lever doing chalitza, rather, may she sit and her hair grow white as an aguna seeing that she behaved incorrectly, unquote. Rabbinic authority, patriarchal authority was paramount in whose protection use of igun as a punishment to women was an always available tool. In the end, the majority of rabbinic decisors of Tzvat ruled that Karo's son should enact chalitza, and he did. Now we want to bring it up. The shtar, the legal document, attesting to the chalitza of, quote, the daughter-in-law, of our teacher, the great Rabbi Yosef Karaway, his may his memory be blessed. It's it's uh it's the handwritten stuff and you know in this printed document. Is so we have the Khalitza, it happened. We have a Khalitza document, it's preserved among a collection of such documents from Jerusalem. I learned of at least two or three other cases in other places and times, which means that there were other such cases. 
where women who did not want to leverage marriage did the same thing to get out of it. I have plenty of evidence that women told one another about such expedients. They tried to help one another. The women were denied systematic means to disseminate such advice, means rabbis enjoyed to disseminate their knowledge and advice. Among the reasons we know that women indeed helped one another avoid or escape traps in rabbinic marriage and divorce practice is that rabbis denounced it and threatened women who did this with forced divorce and loss of their ketubah settlements. In another case, also from 16th century Tzvat, we learn of a ship that went down with 21 Jewish men whose wives then became agunot. Yosef Karo argued against lenient dispensation that would allow these women to remarry. But one of these women took matters into her own hands and remarried without dispensation. Other rabbinic decisors argued against Karo's stringent position, citing the fear that without rabbinic accommodation in a lenient ruling, just as one widow in this group married without asking rabbinic permission, as clearly her partner also did with the necessary participation of two witnesses and an officiant, that is five transgressive Jews in this one case, the other woman in this situation, the other women in this situation, necessarily with partners, would do likewise. Thus, we see that rabbinic awareness that women facing a gun would act assertively, even transgressively, on their own behalf, because in fact they did, led to arguments for leniency in a cluster of aguna cases. Rabbis also expressed fear that if agunot, whose husbands were probably dead, but where proof meeting Talmudic demands was lacking were barred from remarrying, that is, from engaging in licit sex, they would engage in the illicit kind, with male partners, of course. That rabbinic stringency, particularly about young women tied in marital captivity to dead men, or in another subset of cases to converted levers in Iberia, would lead to licentious behavior and the subversion of rabbinic authority and social control. As one decisor in Istanbul explained to rabbinic colleagues' desire to rule leniently about a case discussed in 1503, quote, he saw the future outcome of leaving the woman in Aguna, since women have frivolous minds. First, they are outside, and next, you know, they're in the streets. Stringent ruling would lead to a breach in sexual norms. Rabbis in Kandia, Crete, voiced the same fear about a woman left stranded there by a husband in Istanbul. If not freed by divorce, which they beseech the Istanbul rabbis to arrange, she would go astray. Authorities in Tzfat several times issued rulings that released Agunot in halachically dubious cases because of expressed fear that failure to do so would result in the women pursuing quote unquote evil ways. Conclusion about this. Assertive action by women and rabbinic fear of this, not martyred compliance or pleading, led to an aguna who remarried without rabbinic release from Igun reclaiming her life, and to broader rabbinic arguments for leniency in that and in other cases. Women whose husbands or levers had converted in Spain and Portugal, and who fled to Ottoman lands in order to live open Jewish lives were made agunot by this situation. With more time, I could tell you what ranking Poskin said about this when these women sought release. Bottom line, it was no with rationalizations that are shockingly awful, but some of the women knew of the rabbinic distinction between the Chathila and Bidiyavad, and that if they remarried without permission, they could get on with their lives, and they did. And rabbis, aware of this, their writings are the source of us knowing about these cases, said to leave it be. Thus, we learn from rabbinic sources of a childless widow whose lever remained in Portugal where he had amassed substantial assets after converting and was not about to leave. This Aguna, quote, heard that there are rabbinic sages who say that if she proceeds and remarries, they will not separate her from her second husband, and she acted and remarried, unquote. My point about all this, pre-modern, entirely traditional women living in traditional Jewish societies, there was nothing else, were assertive, aggressive, and transgressive in asserting and acting on their rights. The message they clearly understood was that being good, that is, asking permission, did not yield help, while not asking permission did. There is no blaming the reform movement or feminists or modernity for this behavior by women. It was entirely pre-modern and traditional. My re research also shows that rabbinic stringency and rigidity on this issue also long predated modernity, the reform movement, and feminism, which are typically blamed for such halachic rigidity. Both these behaviors, women's assertiveness to protect themselves in marriage and divorce, 
and rabbinic rigidity in rulings against women's marital free freedom are entirely traditional and pre-modern. I am saying further that the behavior of these women was simultaneously pious and rebellious, referencing the term moredit, which got discussed a great deal about all of this, meaning rebellious, as well as Avraham Grossman's important book about medieval Jewish women entitled Chassidot and Mordot, Pious and Rebellious. Grossman distinguishes between those types. I am saying they were one and the same, that rebellion was piety. The behavior of these women was not rebellion against or rejection of rabbinic law, which was not an option outside of conversion, which we know some agunot denied relief did. These women were inside and part of the community. They acted on the self-evident assumption that they were full constituents of the Jewish legal system, claimants on it, with the demand that it meet their needs. And if it didn't, they took the various actions I have mentioned and others. Those actions then became part of lived Jewish law and what was a dynamic, ever-evolving legal system in which participants in the system did just that, participated. Their behavior became part of that system in which the assertion of women's interests and their insistence on having them met were a normal part of how things work. Such behavior began very early. There's no time to go into this, but it's a big part of my book. Tracing the history of the earliest act of such behavior that I treat, which according to the 10th century Rav Shrira Gaon, occurred centuries before that in the 7th century, with the 7th century Muslim conquest of Iraq and the establishment in Jewish parlance in Babylonia, Bavel, of Sharia courts, in Islam, a Qadi, a Muslim religious judge, can dissolve a marriage. Jewish women who could not get a get began going to Qadis for help, either to put pressure on their husbands and community or to convert to Islam and get divorced that way. Rav Shrirak promulgated Takanata Moredit, which overrode Talmudic law about a woman deed, quote unquote, rebellious. The law stated that such a woman is not to be divorced immediately, but made to wait a year, during which her ketubah settlement is progressively diminished until it is exhausted. If she still wishes a get, a get, then she can have it with no money. Takanat Hamoredet said that such a woman is to receive a get immediately and with her full ketubah settlement. And Shriva references explicitly the reason for this. Because if women don't get divorced when they wish it, quickly and without financial punishment, they will go to non-Jewish courts and authorities and get relief that way. This takana operated in Jewish communities across the Jewish world for 500 years until a rabbinic backlash against this and the power of women altogether, beginning in the late 12th century and solidifying and expanding thereafter, began stripping women of rights and divorce. These regressive, explicitly misogynistic halachic rulings are enforced in rabbinic courts to this day. We know that women are disproportionately represented among the martyred and self-martyred during persecutions of the medieval era. Rabbinic writers praise such women fulsomely for this, holding up such behavior as a model. Yet I came across not one source, and almost all we have are written by rabbis, in which rabbis claim that women ever said that they were martyring themselves on the altar of loyalty to halacha about marriage and divorce, that they accepted igun and their sacrifices agunot on such an altar. Jewish women fought being victimized and becoming victims with all means at their disposal, and their behavior was traditionally Jewish. There is effort today to try to sell women the lie that such martyred acceptance is traditionally Jewish. It isn't. Conclusion. It is the eve of Purim, which means it's basically Erev Pesach. I always say if it's Purim, it's Pesach. As we know, there is no mention of God in the Megillah and no mention of Moshe in the Haggadah. Let those who wish Igun to end, except as a subject of historical study and mourning, akin to that which we reenact during Sphira, take lessons from these books. Not God and not men or a man will deliver Revach Nahatzala from Igun or Fri Agunot. Only we women with organized, sustained, and effective communal support will do that. To cite another text, this is not in the heavens, but in our hands. Oh, thank you so much, Shulamit. Um, okay, so um, we're a little bit over time and I would like to get to the questions that I have as well as the questions from the audience. So the main question that I have really relates to what you're suggesting. 
And what I really want to, I, as I understand it, uh, to engender change, you want women to engage in creative, transgressive, pious behavior. And in addition, you want them to garner communal support for this behavior. Now, regarding transgressive behavior, I'd like to say that I think we're, we do that often in the Center for Women's Justice, for example, alternative bate din, split sass for mamzer. We ourselves are suggesting alternative kiddushin. But do you think your suggestion is realistic? Do you think enough women will agree to act transgressively in order to make an impact? And even if a large mass of women can be enlisted for such acts of, transgr of pious transgression, do you think that they can garner a broad base orthodox communal support for those acts? And in connected to that, I also want to understand how are you, how is your suggestion different from what Rachel Adler has suggested in the past? what Mayor Simcha Feldblum has suggested, or what Rivka Lubitsch from the center has suggested with respect to changing Kiddushin and Kenyan. I want you to focus in, what do we do? What exactly should we do? And how is that different from what has already been suggested? Okay, it's not like I'm inventing the wheel here, but what I am saying, first of all, I hope my book gets a lot of attention. I hope that there's a translation in Hebrew and that there's some version of it in Yiddish. It's extremely important for this information to get much more broadly broadcast than I think it now is. I don't think that most um, women I talk to understand what Kinyan and Kiddushin are. I don't think they do. And when you do put it to them, they're so cowed and they're so worried about family, parents, reactions that they're afraid to act on it. I think we have a lot, a lot of work to publicize this. We're gonna need money to do it on websites and on social media that is active and goes out and grabs people. The website is passive, you have to go to it. Social media goes out and grabs people. We need funding to make that a much more pervasive, much broader based um, action. Um, and ads, spots, booklets. And I know that it, I know that it's not like this hasn't been done, but going and recruiting uh, activists to go out and reach young people in in youth groups, in camps, in army pre pre army pro and programs, extensive efforts to get the word out that this is not a benign system. A that Kenyan and Kiddushin do what they do in the moment and they are the source of Igun. And I don't think that this is broadly understood. And second, I don't think people understand that when they go into a rabbinic court, what's going to go on when they get in there? And I know that the center has it does pioneering efforts and the podcasts that Nitsan uh, Kaspi Shiloni and Rifka Luvich do. I understand that you're doing it. It needs to be done more and it has to be funded in order to get out much more broadly. I don't think that news is out. I'm not telling people to go out and be transgressive on their own. When I say that there has to be a communal effort, it has to be a communal effort um, to support women with legal, legal services, with psychological services, with rabbinic services, with support services for their family, with housing if they have to leave their homes because they're threatened um, by, by husbands or families. It's gonna take a lot of money to who do you think construct who a system that will that support women and will make free choice actually tenable. And the community that you anticipate will support them is? First of all, I think it'll only happen when people understand that this is not an Orthodox problem and it's not an Israeli problem. And right now, I think that that's how it's dismissed. Whereas Jews, overwhelmingly, whatever our religious uh, affiliations, believe that people have a right to religious conscience and they certainly have a right to be free of marital captivity. I don't think that Jews in the diaspora understand that this is a Jewish problem and not just an Orthodox one, and that there is no ethical uh, grounds on which to dismiss it as either an Orthodox problem or an Israeli one. I go to great lengths in the book to explain why that is and how that is. And I think, again, that explanation, that, that, that understanding will take work to get across. I think that Jewish women and good 
men, good men of goodwill can be reached about this. I think I, it'll take a lot of work. I would like to ask you another clarification about that distinction. Of course, we want uh, a global solution for our group. That's clear. But what do you, don't you do? You, but I think that you have to make a distinction between what's happening in Israel and what happens in the United States. Don't you agree that women in Israel should have the freedom of conscience to decide whether or not they want to marry in accordance with Kenyan? Because right now the state mandates that type of marriage. Don't you think that distinction has to be made and that we have to insist on the separation of church and state in Israel? That's not going to happen anytime soon, and you know that better than I do. Right now, there are ways that women and men who don't want to get married by Kenyan and Kiddushim, who don't want not only a chief rabbinate marriage, but any Orthodox, any halachic marriage, can do it. We need to get that word out much more effectively and much more broadly. And that has to happen with people, to, to the young people on the cusp of dating and to getting engaged and getting married. It's the same clientele. There are ways to do it. And the more that it's done, the more we will undermine the seeming lack of alternative. There are alternatives. They're uh, already would, being used. You I know. Also, yes, that is very true. <laughs> Some of our uh, children have actually done that. Um, I would also like to t ask you a theoretical question. Um, I know that a Muslim feminist who I always like to quote named Valerie Mokhadam has discussed um, the limits of reinterpretation of patriarchal cultures, in particular in her case, the, you know, Islam, Islam. And she comes to the very, very clear conclusion that there are limit, limits to the possibilities of reinterpretation. And I think what you're suggesting is a form of reinterpretation. I, I think you can't wiggle out of that, okay? So um, I, I don't see how part of our efforts cannot be that we have to insist that the state stop coercing uh, Jewish couples into the act of Kenyan. I, I think I go insist. I'm with you, but it's not going to happen, and you know it. Well, I don't know how much there is more no party that. now that even discusses it, much less peddles it in an election campaign because it's not going to happen. So the question is. What do we do? And my, as a historian, I know that change comes from quote unquote below. It's not going to come from the disestablishment of state and religion in Israel. It's not going to come from the disestablishment of the chief rabbinate in our lifetime or in our grandchildren's lifetime. It's not going to happen anytime soon. But there are plenty of de facto actions that we can do. And if we can start that happening from quote unquote below and increase the scale of that. And that will, I know, as a historian, that's what did it in all of pre-modernity. It didn't come from the rabbis. It came from below. It came from people doing it. And that's what has to happen. And that's what will make the change. I'm not, I'm not trying to reinvent halacha on this. I'm saying that Jewish practice comes from Jews. Um, I'd like to open it up to the discussion from the group. I'd like to hear other questions. If you have, Hannah, would you like to moderate that? Yes, sure. Okay, so first of all, Norma Joseph said that, she, hi, Shalomit, I'm so proud of you. Um, Diana Kornbrook, you, Norma. <laughs> Diana Kornbrook wrote, the Old Testament accepts slavery as much as did much of the ancient world. Now slavery is not acceptable to rabbis. Uh, as to rabbis, when did that happen? If it can happen to slavery, can it happen to marriage? I mean, you mentioned it later after this question was posted. Um, I'm not looking to rabbis to make any changes. I, I, I hope that's clear, but if it isn't, let me make it clear. I'm not appealing to rabbis. And if you want to keep the gun industry going, keep going back to the rabbis. I'm not, I'm not looking to them at all. I'm saying we make the change. Make it. Okay, thank you. Um, Avi Winokur wrote, similar to civil Hi, rights law. What? <laughs> similar to civil rights laws, only after rebellious action, not merely, ask, not merely asking or pleading. Power is not usually relinquished because the powerful suddenly realize errors of their ways. MLK was not American. And he continues, I think it's very important, which is part of what Shulamit discusses, that folks know that this pious transgression 
is an approach of long standing. Jewish women need to know that they are not alone. History backs them up. Oh, couldn't couldn't agree more. And as far as purchasing the book, I understand it's not yet available for Oh, people. no, it's not even. No, it's just going into production. No, it'll be a while. It'll be out, though. I have a question. Um, you didn't thank you. First of all, thank you very much. It was amazing. And I feel like we've been doing a lot of the stuff that you say that we should be doing. Um, but you, you didn't mention the issue of Mamzerud, and that's a huge issue because it's, it's easy to tell a woman to go get married and don't listen, don't care if she's past the time of having children or whatever. The problem really is when, uh, when when you're afraid of uh, Mamzerud, and that's that's a big issue. Yes, yes, it is. And you know, uh, Rivka Luvich and has has pioneered um, a, a trailblazed an effort on the on that on that issue. I mean, in my book, I I absolutely discuss it. There are twinned issues; they're inseparable. The threat that is held over women that if they get on with their lives. They will be victimized and unborn children will be victimized by stigmatizing them with the term mamzerut. And the uh, the term in English bastard does not does not really uh, um, it's not what mamzerut is. Uh, Susan says in various of her writings that mamzerut is more comparable to the status of Dalits, the quote unquote untouchables in India. No, I mean, that that clearly those are twinned abuses and there will be no solution to Igun and the freeing of Agunot until we understand that uh, I, I use here um, Leah Rabbi Shaktiel's very important um, innovative term, Mimzur. She puts the focus on the act of abusing people and victimizing people and stigmatizing people this way instead of talking about Mamze Root, which suggests that this is an objectively existing status or category. It isn't. It is a stigma. It is a product of bullying and abuse that rabbis do and the rabbinic system does in order to keep agunot in chains. So absolutely, there is no ending one without ending the other. And your efforts are absolutely critical. The question is, how do we get them much more broadly publicized? Again, I... Me, anyway, I don't know about you, but me, I don't appeal to rabbis, but we have to get out to the people because that's where the change will come from. And if you want to undermine these structures, it'll come from the people who understand what's being done to them with them and that these are constructed abuses. They are not independently, objectively existing in nature. They're constructed and they, they persist only if we go along with it. And if there are enough people, because we do need to support one another, we need to talk about it, we need to be open about it. If there are enough people who do it, it it's a it's a snowball kind of thing. Certain point you reach a critical mass and then it changes. We know that historically, that's what we have to engage. What you and what you're doing, what the center is doing, you're absolutely doing the right thing. I'm saying it has to be done on a much broader scale. And I'm also saying that there has to be a dialogue between Israel and the diaspora about this to, in the understanding that it is a Jewish problem. It is not an Israeli problem. It's not an Orthodox problem. It's a Jewish problem. This is a good one that the diaspora and Israel can work together about to, to engage and to make a, a, a major change in Jewish, in Jewish society for, for, the, for a good and healthy Jewish future. We all want that. We want it in Israel. We want it in the diaspora. And instead of the issues that have been used to divide us, this is one that can constructively unite us in a very good and important cause. Thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. I think we're going to close up, Susan. Do you have any final words for Shulamit? I I actually wanted Alexandra to, I, I see she's on the edge of her chair. I thought maybe she'd like to say something before I close. I did, but I didn't know whether you want me to, to try to. We in. want you to, we want you to. Okay. Uh, I'm a family law attorney in California, Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, whatever. I've been doing family law for over 51 years. I have educated a number of judges and lawyers on this issue. I have had a number of 
brides who have come to my office and asked me to um, opine about the halachic prenuptial agreement. I had revised the California version of the halachic pre, uh, prenuptial agreement that was done by the BDA, which frankly I think is in Yiddish, laknetzwasser, useless. And uh, uh, what uh, the problem is that I can reach the lawyers, I can reach the judges. I cannot reach these young women. I cannot reach these parents who think of, uh, who, who don't understand the problem or they say, well, the rabbi won't do anything. I have had a number of, of cases in which I have gotten rabbis who perform the ceremony to do it so that we have non-kosher witnesses who uh, with all kinds of things so that that uh, you know the joint the um, uh, ring ceremony the joint uh, the common ring ceremony the whole ball of wax that invalidates a halachic marriage. But on what you are saying, Shulamit, is that we have to reach all these people. Who are we reaching? The young whippersnapper, 20, 22-year-old girls whose parents are going to say, are you crazy? Don't even go to these programs. Are you going to reach uh, young women who are who are in the throes of, oh my God, I'm getting married. How wonderful, look at my ring. And that's all they're interested in. How are you going to reach these people? Because in 51 years, I have not been able to do that. And, and Los Angeles is not a huge community. We have 600,000 600, Jews, of which probably 10, 15% are Orthodox. So in, Cal in the United States, this really only applies to the Orthodox. And a large percentage are now becoming very right-wing. And uh, so uh, my name is Anathema in Beis Yaakov and wherever else over here. So if I can reach them individually, fine. But even so, they look at me like I'm from outer space. How are you going to get this done, Shalomit? Okay. First of all, I don't think that one lawyer can do it. I don't think that several lawyers can do it. I don't think that a legal office can do it. I think it has to be a broad Jewish communal effort that is very well funded and that uses public ads, and as I said, social media and websites, but social media that is an, that is an active outreach um, uh, type of, of uh, behavior. But it, it, it has to happen on the communal level. A lawyer, you can't do it on your own, you know that. No, we have, we have an organization, his Get Divorce Justice. I know it. And, and, and she's done a fabulous job, and I tell you, her list of Agunot is growing by the second. First of all, let me just say something else. The conservative movement uses Kenyan and Kiddushin. This is not just an Orthodox thing. And I have been to more weddings than I can count that are not uh, halachic, where the groom says to the bride, Hareyat mekudeshet li, kedat betabatsu, kedat mashav Israel. That's the same thing. And people don't understand. But the conservative movement does it also. So this is not just an Orthodox thing. I think it's a major educational effort that has to come at a communal level with significant support and with the help of professionals who know media and who know how to get out and, 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 and market a message. That's not your job. You're a lawyer. That's not what you do. It's not what I do either. But there are people who know how to do that, who know social media and who know how to market. That takes money. And it takes effort and it takes more than a few people to do, but that's what has to happen. Um, okay, Sandy Wasserman raised her hand. Do you want to speak up? Hi, thank you so much. Well, I guess this question is for you, Shulamit. It's also perhaps for Alexandra. So in our older daughter was married in, in the conservative movement in 1999. And uh, she has in her ketubah the Lieberman clause. Are you considering the Lieberman clause just totally useless like any prenup? Is it still popular now? Is it something that just was those few years and I haven't heard of it since, but I, I only learned about it in preparation for her uh, marriage. And it it's 
I thought it was wonderful when I first heard about it. And I wondered why. Labor and, Labor and Clause was a major reform. It's a good thing it's used. I just said that the conservative movement uses Kenyan and Kiddushin. If you do that, you're part of the problem. Okay. okay. Um, we really uh, gone past our time. Yes. But, I think but the issue is that in the conservative movement, you have the rabbis who are authorized to give the get if the husband refuses. That's part and parcel of their program. You don't have that in Orthodox. In Orthodox, it's the husband alone, and that's it, and no rabbi can do that. So mm -hmm. I, I agree, Sandy. I think that that is uh, that is a solution as much as you say. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, it's, uh, it's certainly yeah. better. It's certainly better. No one should get married by Kenyan and Kiddushin, even if you don't become an Aguna. You're turned into a sexual object whose body and reproductivity are being traded. It is fundamentally dehumanizing and degrading to women and should not be used. It is also the, the origin of Igun. Somebody who get marries in a conservative uh, marriage can become Orthodox, can move to Israel. Those things happen. You don't anticipate that you or your children or your grandchildren are going to be different than you and get stuck in this system. But they can, and it happens all the time. I'll say something else. I know we're out of time, but there is no, not one, any effort, any precautionary measure that anyone can take that some rabbi or some rabbinic court can't say is invalid. Doesn't matter if it's a Lieberman clause or this prenup or that prenup or that you had no ceremony whatsoever, but you live together. They'll say you were married and you need to get. If you're going to pay attention to that, you're in their hands and the game is theirs. So the, the that that reminds me of one just one more thing I want to say reminds me of a case where I get a call from someone in Arizona the husband they were about to get married and the husband to be had failed to give a get to his wife they had a a conservative marriage failed to and the rabbi refused to to marry them and he didn't even know where she was so I said, okay, go to the Orthodox. The Orthodox will marry you because they don't believe that the conservative marriage was valid. And that's exactly what happened. Well, that's disgusting, but... Uh -huh. Okay, I, I'm afraid my iPad may be running out of juice. <laughs> as, as <we> really... <laughs> that's why you're cutting us off, Susan? <laughs> In any event, I would, I, would like, I would like to end on, on a note a positive feminist note, at least, which I think uh, is warranted here. And that is that what I think uh, we have done during this whole session and what, what Shulamit has done in her book, and what I think also that we do, we've done in the Center for, at least have done in the Center for Women's Justice, which is raise the consciousness of at least some of us as to as to what really is going on here and that as Shulami just said it's about uh, and as we've said for many years that this is an act of purchase of women's uh, sexuality and it's an exclusive conj conjugal servitude that is mandated by the halakha so um I would so just say, we can we can change consciousness we can it's been done it's a tremendous amount of work it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of money and it takes professionals who know what they're doing, but it okay. can't be done and it has to be done. Yes. And, and your book and Noah's book and all the activity of the Center for Women's Justice, which at the very least has made us aware that um, marital captivity is no longer a religious right, but a civil wrong. Um, all of this are acts of feminist consciousness. And I thank you all for supporting us and listening during this whole time. Uh, so thank you. And thank, thank you, of course. Thank you. And thank to you, to Susan. Of, and to all of what you supporters of the Center for Women's Justice and all you feminists feminists everywhere, Jewish feminists. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It was fabulous. Thank you so much. I learned so much. Thank you, everyone. Look out for the email.